you know, if you've got that in a business relationship and you're trying to drive something forward, I mean, it's unthinkable that you have to deal with things like that. Mm. Who does that? Yeah, it's amazing. You know, and you see what's happened to me. I mean, I think I'm told, if you look at GFH's last year's group annual profit, they've spent the full amount of that on chasing me. So they spent about six, seven million pounds, legal fees and PR, they had three PR companies, loads of lawyers, I mean, countless this, that and the other, on chasing me for a three million quid they allege I pinched. Does that sound like there's something else they're trying to cover up? Is that what the, 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 the crux of it, that they accuse you of stealing three million pounds and yep. that's what they wanted to get you back over to Dubai for? Yeah. Um, I mean, I've heard that you know people said, don't go back, don't go back, but you went back. Yeah. Uh, obviously that was the wrong decision, but you know, at the time, you didn't think that anything like that would I've done anything wrong. So, I mean, you know, yeah. I mean, you don't, I mean, I, you know, I sat, I was, I know Ken, um, you know, gave an interview saying that I talk, I was talking to him a day or two before I went, and he said, don't go. You know, my family had said, don't go. Other investors had said, don't go. Um, you know. Why did you go? I hadn't done anything wrong. I mean, the relationship between me and GFH at that time was not very good. You know, they hadn't paid Sport Capital back. They had breached the contract with Sport Capital. My relationship with Hisham was not good. You know, I was very upset with the mess they had left me within. You know, I mean, there came a point when we were having to have advice on liquidation, things like that, and it was disaster. And so I was very upset with everyone. And I discovered all this stuff, the Iranian money, this, and it was an, a mess. So, you know, I needed to go. We were having lots of discussions. And everyone's always said to me, if they were so very bad, why did you go back to talk about a job? Mm. That's a good question. But the reality is that it wasn't to go back to talk about a job as such. Now, you know, Hisham was saying, why don't you come back to be legal counsel again? Come to Bahrain. I mean, this was like an ongoing conversation we always had. Right. Because he was always firing staff, this, that, and the other. And he's always trying to get me to go to Bahrain before all this happened. Um, it was almost like a comedy joke. Um, and, you know, at this time, I was leaving. I wasn't staying with Massimo. Um, and my plan was to develop sport capital to take sport capital and to create it into a sport financing industry. You know, this is what I wanted to do and this is something that I'm doing now. Um, so we provide loans and financing to clubs to acquire stadiums, to develop players. Um, and this is what I was going to do. And Hisham knew this. And you know, it, when I was at GFH, and I'd already said that it wasn't my role, but I ended up bringing in most of the money, most of the investments, things like that. So I thought, well, I'll establish something like that in London. I'll work on developing sport capital. And obviously doing it myself has to put my money in. It's always a risk. And we'd had these discussions with Hisham and he had basically said, look, rather than you do it yourself and risk all that, GFH want to set up GFH London. And I know there's all these issues, but and the, the messages are there. We'll give you autonomy. We'll give you a budget. You can set it up the way that you want and you bring all your contacts and, all your, and you do that. So essentially I was getting what I wanted, but without risking my capital and still getting a share in it. Yes, I ended up having to have the GFH tag, but if it was a completely standalone office, may not have even called it GFH mm. Capital, may have called it something else, which is common because GFH now is a, they've kind of remodeled themselves as a holding company, so they've purchased more things, obviously using credit. Um, so it wasn't, I'm going to get a job with them, it was they were investing in something that I was going to essentially run and you know that th they would own. So what happened? Did you, did you land and then? Well, suddenly arrested I mean, or how did sent me a ticket. They sent me a ticket, paid for my visa, because um, I'd been there for so long, so they paid for my visa, uh, sent me a ticket. Um, I got on the plane, first class, unbelievably, um, and I wasn't well because I'd had surgery literally days before, and they knew that because I met Janesh in London about two days before they did this, and it was at the hotel in, um, I forget the name of the hotel, it was at a hotel in, in King's Cross, um, and um, we were, he saw how ill I was, I couldn't eat. I was literally couldn't stand. I was ill, sweating, not very well, grey. Um, and even with that, this person, who is a current director in the football club, was lying to me to bring me to an Islamic jurisdiction where they would have me locked up and tortured for two years. You know, so I get off the plane, go home, and uh, sleep, wake up, get my car, and my car breaks down. And this is sometimes when you think there's signs from God, because my car broke, my car's broken. I'm like, sorry, I need to, you know, I need to get to the, I need to get to the office. So the car is, and it's a nice car, steaming and doing everything it can to make sure I don't get there. But right. I'm stubborn, right? So I'm like pushing it, pushing it, pushing. I get there, the car's like, like this, lands. 
I get out, I go in, and I'm supposed to be meeting some director, uh, some new director who I think is about 60 or Dr. Hallett, his name is, Abu Dhabi guy. Whether or not he's involved, I don't know in all of this. And instead, a 19 year old with a Kandora, which is that long white thing they all wear, and a baseball cap comes in. And I actually make a joke, and I'm like, you're a bit young to be a doctor. You know, and I'm like, this is a bit strange. And then Janesh, like a weasel from Wind in the Willow, suddenly vanishes, you know, with his little weedy eyes, off he goes. You remember, it reminds me of, um, you know, Monsters, Inc.? Right. What's that lizard, the, the bad lizard from Monsters, Inc.? I know the one you mean. Yeah, that one. Yeah. He reminds me of that one. Um, so he kind of scurries off. And um, I'm like, hang on a minute, I've just come all this way. And, you, and, and then this guy's like, come with me. I'm like, what do you mean, come with you? Come with me. I was like, why? Like this, very bad English. She shows me a card, says CID. Doesn't say the word arrest or anything like that. And I just think it's a check or something like that. Because I've been away for a while and bounce, checks get bounced, not just if you haven't got the money, but if your signature's a little bit different. So it's quite common sometimes that if the signature's not different, the bank clerk will reject. So I go with him. And uh, sure enough, they're like, oh yeah, it's a check. Okay, fine, they're giving you the money. It's no problem, it's my signature was different. Because some of my, you've seen my signature, everyone is a bit of a mess. And um, well, I now know that someone forged it a hundred times that was in GFH. But um, so, and then after that, they're like, well, there's something else. Like, what? And all this time, I'm sending messages to Hisham and Janesh. Please hold the doctor. It isn't little me, right? Please hold the doctor. I'll try, it's a check issue. I'm trying to get back as soon as I possibly can. Don't let him go away, right? Because I want to talk to the guy. They're playing along with it and with me. Oh, what is it? Why are you there? This, 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 all the messages. And I can show you later on. And the constant lying. People that are in positions of trust in a football club, that have passed the football league test, being dishonest, continually dishonest. You know, these are regulated individuals. You're supposed to be able to trust them with your money. And then the bad stuff starts to take me to a room. I see the GFH lawyer that I appointed, standing there, pointing and laughing in Arabic. And then um, they put me in a room, screaming at me, where's the money, you did this, 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 push me around, um, and this kind of goes on and on and on. And then, you know, my phone runs out of battery. Um, and then I get locked up. And I'll never forget it because, I, you know, I've just been pushed around, I'm in a police station, I'm supposed to be meeting this person, I'm sick, I can't eat, I'm unbelievably tired because I haven't slept. And then, all of a sudden, they're taking me into the most, you know, it's like the bog of eternal stench of a smell of a place with an iron door that's about that thick. Unbelievably warm, people screaming and shouting and slam it shut behind me. And then you see this new world where I spent two years pretty much of my life. And it was in that cell that you, that's, you didn't move from there? Yeah. Well, no, about a year and a half I was there and then I moved to two other places. But that's a story for another day. What was the... I mean, uh, we've heard and we've spoken about the, the, the treatment that you had. What was a, a typical day like for you? I mean, the, the days were geared around Islam and Sharia. So you'd be woken up at about 3.34 for morning prayer. Whether you prayed or not, you'd get up because everyone else would get up. Um, and, you know, the day would go on and it was pretty horrific. Busy, dirty, squalid, sewage on the floor, rubbish on the floor, cockroaches everywhere, people being beaten up people, um, you know, I mean, the station that I was in, a guy called Lee Bradley Brown, a few years before I got there, was murdered by the police, beaten up by the police in that station. It's all across the papers people can see. So you know that that has happened. And the British Embassy has not been particularly helpful. You have GFH with their full force of all these lawyers trying to do all this horrible stuff for me. You're being beaten, you're being tortured, you can't eat. You know, the first few weeks was horrific because I couldn't eat. I'm a vegetarian and I'm quite a militant vegetarian. I won't eat meat, full stop. So that answers the question for people sometimes when they say, if you're on a desert island and there's only a, there's only a cow, what would you do? I would starve, because right. this is what I was doing. I ended up in hospital, I had a bleeding stomach. I mean, it was a nightmare for me. And, and then you realize that all the people that you trusted, the lawyers that you had appointed, that you, you know, I've been to Hustler, a strip club, I shouldn't admit to this, but I've been to a strip club with this Peter Gray from Gibson Dunn and with people from GFH, an Islamic bank. They'd gone to a strip club in Las Vegas Right. Spearmint Rhinos in London, you know, yeah. the directors, the people that you see had gone there, obviously very Islamic. You know, we had a close relationship and they did this to me for money. And as we now know, they tried desperately to make sure I couldn't get out. A Twitter case, a Facebook was coming. You know, which bank in the world spends six, seven million pounds to keep someone, a former employee in jail and then files a Twitter case against them to keep them in jail for six months, which ultimately I was acquitted of. 
Could you ever imagine seeing Barclays do that? Well, no. And I ever? Think it was a, it, that's the staggering thing about uh, that whole situation, really. So they want to come to England. They want yeah. to invest in our amazing country with our amazing people and our amazing rules and football. But they don't want to follow the law. They want to breach freedom of speech. They want to breach human rights. And these are British people. You know, Jidesh Patel, right, is British. Mm. You know. Uh, it, did you feel forgotten about by yeah. like the UK government? There yeah. was. I mean, I spoke to your sister on a number of occasions. We were getting up, uh, quite a few people involved to try and, you know, get your case heard. But did you feel completely forgotten about? Yes. I mean, you know, and I do. And I, whether it was because my expectations were too high. Because you know, you, I really did. When you, you know, I always remember the old Barclay Card International Rescue adverts with Rowan Atkinson. You know, you're a British person. We all watch James Bond, and you expect when you get into trouble, someone set you up. It's a despicable extremist Islamic organisation, um, and I mean GFH. Mm. Um, you know, you expect Miss Moneypenny to come through the doors with somebody that looks a bit like James Bond. You know, and get you out, right? Particularly when you haven't done anything. Yeah, and you didn't live there. And he was set up, and the minute, the, well, not the minute, but you, you get off the plane, you're immediately there. It's obvious it's a setup. You expect them, everybody to see that, and then you're out. But no, they didn't. They couldn't even get me food to eat in the first three weeks. It was only until the media started that they were like, oh dear, we need to actually do something. And it's like the media forced the embassy to do a bit more, but they don't do enough. And it's, you know, I'm out now, and one of the things I do at the moment, I'm helping a lot of other people that are still there, or people that are worried about people that might end up in jail there. And I'm involved, you know, there's quite a few cases I'm pushing with the British Embassy. It was only yesterday or the day before I was with the Minister for the Middle East, Tobias Elwood. And, you know, I've agreed to give him um, uh, uh, a document that's going to show all the cases that I, I'm concerned about. Yeah. Where they're not getting enough. There's a case at the moment who I'm trying to help with a chap that's got TB. He, you know, British businessman, check case, um, contracted TB, hasn't been looked after properly, literally lying on the floor, not given medication. He was cut from here to here. Just horrific and okay we can't expect the embassy to get the people out that's their law they've got to go through the system but at least make sure they get food and water and medical treatment you know if an emirati comes here and gets in a bit of a bother in a bar in mayfair which yeah. i'm sure happens all the time they'll get proper justice they won't get beaten up they'll get access to a lawyer they'll get access to food to human rights we'll respect them we'll try and help them we're not going to lock them up for six months because they put something on Twitter about the Queen. What was the worst point in the two years? I think the worst point was um, in the first few weeks, I mean, it's been well published, you know, I had all these legal cases coming in, legal cases, legal cases, legal cases. Every time I tried to see a lawyer, the other side, GFH was sending people down to stop me seeing my lawyers because they didn't want me to defend myself. So I'm trying, fighting through a cage to see lawyers and at the same time they're sending people down to stop me having access to lawyers you know they would translate stories they translated a story on my sexuality which I've always kept very private because no one else's business right and there's never been an reason to talk about it they took this they translated it the name of my partner and they gave it to the policeman and tried to get me beaten up or abused in an Islamic country it didn't actually work it, you know but and so this all happened at the same time and I remember and I talked about it a lot with the interview I gave to prisoners abroad you know looking at a strong piece of rope which was a piece of thing that had come off the bed and you do think well is there an end to this is there an easy way out yeah. you know I considered it you know suicide for quite a while um, not because you've done anything wrong but because you just saw well, these, these powerful people they threatened me I'm here I can't get out I don't speak the language they're trying to stop me have lawyers every time I get a lawyer they what do you do and but then I got my common sense back and there was another Brit in there with me, an, an older chap, and he was like, well, no, if you think about it, don't be stupid, fight them. And that's exactly what I'm doing. And who do you blame? Hisham, purely. Hisham set this all up. He made a mistake, paid me money he shouldn't have done, set it all up, basically, got himself in a bit of a mess, and then thought, well, dear, I either blame myself and I lose my job, or I blame David, what am I gonna do? Blamed me, and then he appointed all these other people to come back. It was like Janesh. Janesh was fired by GFH over, you know, let's just say, interesting missing money related. I'm not saying he took the money, but I'm saying there was missing money on the India project and he was fired by the chairman. So hang on a minute, you bring him back to accuse... It's a little bit strange. Uh, David, thank you very much for, for your time on TV Yorkshire. It's been a pleasure. Pleasure. Thanks so much. Thanks. Now, 
essentially Jeff H didn't have the money. From day one, there was no money. Yeah. I At mean, what point during that process did you suddenly think, hang on a second, there, there's something really wrong here, and now they're changing their idea? It was constantly changing. One week it would be decisions to get rid of staff and get rid of them the bad ways, the investigators they employed to come in and spy on people. And we were, he saw how ill I was. I couldn't eat. I was literally couldn't stand. I was ill, sweating, not very well, grey. Um, and even with that, this person, who is a current director in the football club, was lying to me to bring me to an Islamic jurisdiction where they would have me locked up and tortured for two years. 